Hey guys, we're going to start chapter two today. Chapter one, as you recall, uh, is some basic foundational information, like the different types of governments and the different forms of governments and the ideals of American government, some basic building blocks. What we're going to do today or what chapter two is about, it's more of an American history class where we look at uh, the origins of American government how we got to where we are. And to do that, we're going to be going back in time. And we're going to be looking at certain events and documents and people that influenced us. So let's go on and get started. Section one is all about uh, the roots of American democracy. How did England influence us? They're going to influence us with the ideas of representative government, limited government, individual rights. We're going to look at the colonies and how they tried different ideas. And then we're going to look at intellectual traditions, uh, the idea of republicanism, natural rights, religious influences, and most importantly, the Enlightenment. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is how did England influence us? And it is big time. We're only going to focus on three big ideas. And the first one is re the idea of a representative government. The idea that we elect people to represent us in government. This began in the 11th century in England. So in the 1000s, after 1066, when uh, William conquered England. In England, England's legislature evolved into Parliament. Parliament became is a two-chamber legislature. So we call this a bicameral legislature. Bicameral, bi, like bicycle has two wheels, bicameral has two houses. In the upper house that we call the House of Lords uh, consisted of nobles, the upper class. Then the lower house we call the House of Commons, where local people from the different communities were elected to, uh, to the House of Commons. This should look pretty familiar. It should sound pretty familiar. We have Congress. We have a lower House of Congress, and we have an upper House of Congress. Another idea, another big idea from England, is the idea of a limited government. So if there is a limited government before that, we must be talking about an unlimited government. This began in England way back in 1215. King John was heavily in debt uh, from fighting the French. And so he went to increase taxes on the nobles. And the nobles said, no, we've had enough. We're tired of paying uh, more and more taxes so you could fight your wars. They said, you have to stop. We, the nobles, have rights. And if you want us to pay more taxes... You're going to have to sign this document. King John needed the money. He was desperate for it. So he signed the document that we now call the Magna Carta or Great Charter. It talked about uh, how the king could not do certain things to the nobles. The king could not increase taxes without some sort of permission. And the king couldn't have a sham trial against nobles that he simply didn't like. This is big. Even though King John had no intention of following the Magna Carta, even though it wasn't uh, seen as this huge momentous document that we see it now, it's important because we started moving from the idea of the rule of man, where the king, I am king, I will tell you what to do. Why? Because I am the king. To the idea of the rule of law. The rule of law. We have a series of rules that are written down that says you cannot do these things. That's big. Limited government. The government is limited in its powers. The third major idea uh, from England is the idea of individual rights, that we humans have rights. We're going to start in the year 1628. King Charles was in debt. He needed more money to fight a war. Sounds familiar, I know. <laughs> And so he was required to sign the petition of right. And once again, like King John, King Charles had no intention of following the petition of right. He just needed the cash to continue fighting his wars. 
But in the petition of right, it said the king had to obtain parliament's approval to increase taxes. The king couldn't imprison people without a just cause, and the king couldn't have martial law or military rule during peacetime. This should sound really familiar. Instead of monarch, say president. Instead of parliament, say Congress. So it required the president to obtain Congress's approval before levying new taxes. The president just can't throw people in jail because he doesn't like them. And also included in our Constitution are rules regarding martial law. So we are taking ideas from England, like the idea of representative government and in individual rights, and we are applying them to us. Now, with the uh, idea of individual rights, things kept getting uh, uh, bad in England. And England's actually going to go through a civil war, the English Civil War, which you learned about in world history class. That's where James, King James and King Charles and Oliver Cromwell were all involved. We're going to skip ahead to 1689. Uh, after the English Civil War, after the rule of Oliver Cromwell and uh, Richard Cromwell, that the people had had enough of their kings trying to act like absolute monarchs. They said, we have rights. Parliament has rights. You are not an absolute monarch, and we will not allow you to do that. And so Charles II and uh, Jane, uh, excuse me, Charles was ran off. Charles II was ran off. And the people asked Mary and her husband, William of Orange, to be king and queen of England. So the people are asking someone to rule over them. The people are selecting their leaders. Sounds familiar. And they said, before you sign this, before you accept, you need to sign this document called the English Bill of Rights. And in this document outlines the rights that all Englishmen have, that we have freedom of speech, that we have protections from cruel and unusual punishment. William and Mary said, okay, we agree to this. We acknowledge that everyone has these rights and that we as rulers cannot do everything that we want. This document established England as a constitutional monarchy. It officially did that the kings and queens of England are limited in power. So they are constitutional monarchs. They are now, they are, excuse me, no longer absolute monarchs. So just to recap, we have the ideas of representative government, which we borrowed from England. We have the idea of limited government, which we borrowed from England. And we have the idea of individual rights, which again, we borrowed from England. Uh, now we're gonna spend just a minute on the English colonies. All the colonies tried out different ideas about government. You see Jamestown's House of Burgesses, the Mayflower Compact, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, the Massachusetts Bodies of Liberty, Body of Liberties. All these included different things about government, and we were experimenting with them. For instance, in 1620 with the Mayflower Compact, before the pilgrims even landed, they were on the Mayflower sailing over, they said, hey, what are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to organize things? And so the pilgrims agreed to form a government. And they said, we're going to, going to elect people to, the, to this government. And this government is going to pass laws. And the government's going to do what's best for the public, for us, for the people. In exchange, we will obey these laws. Should sound pretty familiar, but this is a novel idea, especially in the Americas. So the Mayflower Compact was an agreement that the people came together, form a government, the government makes just and fair laws, and the people obey them. That's pretty important. The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, another example, specifically listed idea, listed things that the government could not do. So it's the idea of limited government. Important. Now, today, uh, we may not think much of it, but these are you know new things that we are doing for the very first time. And so they are important. 
Uh, there's different types of colonies. Uh, I won't spend hardly any time on this, but we have three different types of colonies, proprietary, royal, and charter colonies. Let's move on to intellectual influences. And the first intellectual influence is the idea of republicanism, where, uh, just look at this word republicanism, the root word is republic, where people, it's the idea of a representative democracy, where people elect someone uh, to vote on their behalf. This idea goes all the way back to Greece and Rome, so way 2,000 years ago. And uh, even then, there's the ideas of civic participation, that you have to vote, you have to elect your representatives, you have to be willing to uh, be that representative. There's the idea of doing what's best for the public or the public good. And the idea of civic virtue, being a good citizen, obeying the laws, voting. Those are all ideas of republicanism, which are all ideas that we share today here in the United States. There's also religious influences. We call it the Judeo-Christian influence, where there's ideas of uh, religion, uh, beliefs in religion that have been uh, implemented into laws and rights that humans have. The most important influence is the Enlightenment. Now, in world history, you talked about the Enlightenment. You spent quite a bit of time on the Enlightenment. This was an intellectual movement that occurred in 18th century Europe, so in the 1700s. And it was a bunch of ideas. It was people thinking and it was people thinking about government and how government should act and how government should treat the people. Ideas of the Enlightenment, I'm going to tell you guys, are all over our government. It's chock full. It's found in the Declaration. It's found in our Constitution. But the ideas of the Enlightenment uh, are all over American government. We're special because we actually took these ideas and applied them. And, and so we actually just didn't think about it like the Enlightenment philosophers did. We put it into action. We have philosophers like uh, Thomas Hobbes, who talked about the need for a strong national government. He actually advocated for a, uh, an absolute monarch because he thought people were naturally selfish and greedy. And that if we didn't have a government, we would kill each other. So the idea of the government protecting us uh, as a fundamental uh, basis for the government, that was Thomas Hobbes. We have uh, Rousseau, who wrote a book called The Social Contract, where he said people are born good, but society corrupts them, that we need a democracy. In fact, we need a direct democracy where all of us could vote and elect our and decide on what's best. John Locke took the idea of a social contract, the idea that the people are going to give up some rights to the government, and in exchange, the government protects us. That's the idea of the social contract, that the people form a government, give up some rights, like today, we can't do everything that we want, and in exchange, the government protects us. It's a contract. Like when you buy a car, you give the, the dealer money and then the dealer gives you a car. That's an agreement or a contract. In this case, it's a social contract between society, the people, and the government. John Locke added on to the uh, social contract and said, if the government doesn't protect us, what can we do? Boot them. Start up a new government. Uh, I forgot to mention, one of my favorite quotes is by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and it's actually the very first line of his book, and I'm going to paraphrase it, and he said, man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Think about that. Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. What he's saying is that we have rights. We have human rights. We are born free and everywhere we are in chains, and everywhere we are being told, you can't do this, you can't do that, our rights are 
binding us or our, they, these rules are binding us that everywhere we are in chains. John Locke uh, specified what these rights were. He said, we have natural rights, life, liberty, property, Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson said, we have unalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, that if the government doesn't uphold its rights, we can overthrow it. That's in the Declaration of Independence, one of John Locke's ideas. John Locke is going to be the most important enlightened philosopher for the United States. We have other uh, philosophers, other people that influenced us. Adam Smith uh, influenced us in an economic way. Voltaire, William Blackstone. Uh, William Blackstone actually wrote down uh, the laws of England. And then the colonies took that book, took those rules and laws, and used them as a foundation for our laws, which we, you know, we can still see a lot of similarities between Blackstone's laws and the laws that we have today. So there's all sorts of influences. And you can see that's why we call it the, the roots of American democracy, the, the foundation, things that you really don't think about because they're underground, just like roots are. What I want you to do now is I want you to, I want to make sure that you read chapter two, section one. It goes into a little bit more detail than what this video does. And then I want you to do the chapter two, section one guided reading. This takes all these ideas from the video, from the book and condenses it. It gets down to just the nuts and bolts, no extra fluff, just the absolute bottom line information. I want you to do that as well. If you have any questions over any of this in section one, uh, you can watch this again. Uh, maybe that will help you. Or just email me, ask for help. Say, I didn't understand this, or what do you mean by that? Perfectly okay, I respond and help you out any way I can. Until next time, have a good day.